we would like to start now, if that's okay. So uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, this talk is about uh, Tosca. Tosca is a standard for topology and orchestration of uh, cloud application. Uh, in this talk today, I'll try to explain why orchestration is important for, for your cloud operation and uh, especially why workflows are important. And I'll explain in details about the Tosca standard. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Yaron Parasol. Yaron is a modern Hebrew name. Parasol is a strange Polish family name. I'm a lead product manager uh, of Cloudify, which is a Tosca implementation product uh, of Gigaspaces. And I'm also a member of the Tosca technical committee. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, application deployment lifecycle. So I guess all of you are familiar with those uh, different stages, provisioning infrastructure, installing middleware and uh, different platforms that serve your application, configuring those, gluing them together, deploying the application code, monitoring, and if necessary, scaling again, which means again, provisioning, installing, configuring, and so on. There are so many of those stages that still require manual involvement. And manual involvement leads to outages and errors. So 80% of uh, mission critical outages are, maybe not surprisingly, created by people and uh, process faults. And out of these, 50% uh, happen due to changes uh, changes to configurations, new releases, integrations, and handoffs between uh, development and operations. So um, this is uh, not the best situation, to say the least, and we need to, we need to find a way to fix that. And so uh, a lot has been done already, right? So most of our organization already uh, standardized their procedures and stack consolidated, virtualized for the most part to gain uh, more agility and uh, using golden images, try to avoid errors. And then um, most of the organizations want to be in the, in the phase where they actually automate their stack, their uh, um, production processes. Automating uh, in the most basic level means separate components and separate tools. And if you really want to take it to the phase where you get uh, most cost effectiveness and where you get less error prone and where you get most of the agility, or in other words, where you get most of the cloud, uh, you would like to orchestrate all of those components, all of those procedures, all of those steps that I just showed. So this is exactly why Tosca was formed. So Tosca is an OASIS standard uh, supported by IBM, CA, Rackspace, Reddit, Huawei, and other companies. Uh, I'm also, Gigaspace is also a sponsor and member of this uh, technical committee. And as I said, it stands for topology and orchestration specification of cloud applications. Um, the goals are pretty straightforward. We would like to have something, a standard that is cross-cloud and cross-tools, because we don't want to have people um, sticked or locked in to a specific uh, infrastructure as a service. We don't want to lock them to, to tools. Many people already have tons of investment in, in automation tools. And uh, a lot of organizations have skill sets like Bash or PowerShell. You cannot just uh, make them move to another tool and believe that this is actually going to happen. So cross tool and cross cloud is important. So it's agnostic to the infrastructure as a service. And regarding the status of this standard, so the first version was uh, actually coded uh, in XML in the sense that uh, there is a schema for, for the syntax. Uh, I found it very, very cumbersome. It's, it's very good for uh, machine to machine interface less so for the user. And so, uh, happily enough, we discovered uh, six months ago in Hong Kong that uh, there are some guys in Tosca who really want uh, to have a YAML notation. And at, this, at the same time, we were already in an advanced situation where we uh, kind of formed our own 
Tosca inspired the AML uh, notations, and when we exchanged notes, we found out that we have very, very much similar ideas. So um, since then, we joined the committee. The YAML version is doing progress. It's in final design. Uh, at the same time, we already have our own YAML, and later we're going to uh, support also the standard. So um, I think the main reason to use Tosca is, of course, to have a standard so different organizations can move between different orchestrators and uh, um, people can collaborate. And the nice thing about Tosca is that it really describes the entire thing. It describes any topology, so you don't care about which stack and which structure your application uh, production environment looks like. And it supports any automation process. So there's, there's actually two parts to Tosca. There's the declarative part that describes the topology, and there's the um, imperative parts that describe the processes. And, and I'll, see, I'll show that in a second. And of course, it's portable. So there are three main uh, building blocks. Uh, the first building block is application topologies. So that's like a graph of components describing the different uh, components of the application, uh, their life cycle, and their interdependencies. That's the declarative part. We will see that in details. There's uh, the workflows. Uh, part which is imperative. So in other words, you need different processes, different flows um, to actually manipulate and create those topologies. And uh, the best way to do these are algorithms, and those algorithms in this case works running inside a workflow engine as a workflow script. Uh, Tosca doesn't uh, 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 bind you to a specific tool, but uh, they prefer BPMN, which is a standard. Um, the last part are policies. Policies are sets of rules that enforce some kind of uh, uh, business commitment or uh, application health or uh, different uh, other, other types of things that needs to be verified when the application is, is uh, being installed or up and running. And that's also, uh, there's a debate whether this should be again inside the declarative part or whether that, this also needs to be described as algorithm in, in an imperative way. So uh, there's still not a decision in that regard. Uh, it's still quite early in the Tosca work, but um, I'll talk about our take later. OK, so uh, that's a mock of our GUI. Actually, I don't have in this, in this screenshot, it's not the final one, but just for uh, um, you know, illustrating what I'm talking about. So in this, uh, in this um, graphic screen, I, I guess you can very easily identify the application, any kind of application. So you see uh, some rectangles that represents uh, types of VMs. Uh, you can see uh, the other uh, nested rectangles as, as the middleware tiers, different web servers, app servers, database servers, and Inside, you see the, the different application artifacts or modules, whether these are WAV files, schemas, or whatever you have there. And of course, there are, there are um, not just uh, uh, nested in the sense that things are uh, hosted on each other, but there are, there are also uh, connections and dependencies. So in, in this case, they are uh, depicted as arrows. So I guess for each one of you, this, this makes tons of sense. Let's see if Tosca could actually translate this kind of graphics into, into a readable notation. So um, Tosca uh, modeled this, um, this uh, graphic screen that we've just seen. And what we've seen here, there are, there are different layers, infrastructure, platform or middleware and application modules and the relationships, what's hosted in what, on what, sorry, and what's connected to what. And uh, in Tosca, there are terms and uh, syntax exactly for that. So all the components in the topology, regardless of their level, are called uh, nodes. And each node has a type. So uh, you, can, you can have like object-oriented code reuse and encapsulation, so there are hosts, uh, databases, web servers, routers, networks, any, any level of component, any type of component that you uh, may find in your application. And of course, it's, a, it's an extendable 
uh, set of components, so you can add types. So types are like classes in an object-oriented uh, programming language. Now, uh, each type defines properties. So properties would be um, the configuration that you want uh, to have for a specific type. So sometimes it's just the schema, which, which properties needs to have values in runtime, and sometimes you, you actually set default values. So for example, a host might have an image ID or a hardware flavor and stuff like that. The other very important uh, thing in the type is the interface. So each type has operations which are like method in object oriented. And uh, in, in the type they are abstract. That means that they are just uh, the names of the operations. And then you can actually have the default implementation inside the, the type or you can have a concrete type with the implementation or you can actually have the implementation inside the instance. But in any event you have uh, the type declare and later implement some interfaces. So the most basic interface is the lifecycle interface. We'll, we'll see that later, but you can add as many interfaces as, as you need for upgrade, for whatever process you want to have. And those uh, interfaces and hooks are later invoked by the processes, or in other words, by the workflows. And the last thing is that those nodes are connected um, one to another using relationships. So again, we have classes that represent relationships and they also have interfaces and uh, I'll show all of that in details. Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let's look at some uh, structure and syntax in more closely. So um, I said, like I said, there's classes and there are objects. So classes are node types. That's, that's the uh, exact, the accurate term. So a node type de um, describes a cloud or software type, and it maps the type to the actual implementation. So in this slide, you can see the very basic uh, interface, the create, configure, start, stop, and delete hooks are part of the lifecycle interface. And I can add as many custom interfaces as I need, and I map uh, each of these, uh, each of those uh, uh, operations or hooks I map to a, a, some kind of implementation, um, and we'll see that in a second. Um, another thing that um, is nice in the node type and in Tosca is uh, capabilities and requirements. So capabilities uh, is something that this type can offer to other nodes at runtime. So in, in this case, uh, we have a capability of hosting. That means that um, this, uh, this component can host other components. And it actually says which, which type of component it can host. So in this case, it's a database server and it can host databases. So it can host your schemas. And the requirements uh, is where one node uh, declares what, what it needs to get from other nodes in order to be implemented. So, for example, a, a database now declares that it actually needs um, a, a database server, for example. Or a, a web server declares that it needs a host to reside on. So, uh, when the workflow is actually executed, Tosca can do this wiring and, and validation based on requirements and capabilities. So that's really cool. It's a good way to verify your process as, as, you, as you go executing it. And of course, relationships. Relationships are very important. We all know that. So uh, another type of classes would be relationship types. So uh, requirements and capabilities that we, we just uh, see, and those are the implicit way to describe a relationship, but you usually need an explicit way because wiring them together may work when you host something within a VM, but it won't work when you need to connect, let's say, a RabbitMQ to a Tomcat. So in that case, you need a specific script or specific uh, uh, chef recipe to do that. 
Um, so again, we, we need uh, interfaces. So there is also an interface for relationship with verbs like pre-configure, post-configure, establish, and unlink. So um, again, we have the operations and the implementations for these, and we can have subtypes of relationships. So uh, Tosca declared the basic types, depends on, hosted on, and connects to. But of course, we have to declare subtypes for concrete uh, pairs of tiers or pairs of infrastructure uh, components. For example, if I want to connect a router to a network, I have to write a very specific implementation for that using the cloud API. Uh, so I have to have a subtype of interface, something like router connected to network. Once I have most of these types out of the box, it's very easy for my user to use them inside uh, what we call a service template in Tosca and in Cloudify, we actually call it a blueprint. So no, no templates are like objects. They are like the instances of those types and they declare the specific properties. So for example, if I declared uh, an, a node template which is a out of type server, maybe now I need specific properties for, um, for a cloud stack or for another infrastructure as a service. Uh, the same is true for any type of web server or database. I have to have the specific properties in order to allow for the specific implementation to, to get the configuration it needs. And then I have artifacts. Uh, there are two types of artifacts. What I need to install, the binaries, where I actually take the binaries or the package, and which version, etc. And the other thing is how to install. So these are mapped to the, to the interface operations. So these are the actual implementations. Uh, they call them artifacts. In Cloudify, we use the term plugin, but it's the same thing. And of course, uh, the node template can have requirements and capabilities for validation and for wiring. So um, basically, the node template is an instance of, of, the, of the class. So uh, it's very clear what it has to have. And here are some examples. Um, this is a, in this example, we see uh, WordPress application. So um, the WordPress application needs a, an Apache host to reside on. And of course, there is another node template for the Apache who needs a, who needs a VM. And, and then there is uh, the WordPress database um, that needs the database connection. Um, sorry, there is the Apache who needs a database connection. And of course, there is an, another node for the database. And, and this node also needs a host and so on and so forth. So, any application, no matter how complex it is, can be described through this uh, notation of uh, nodes and relationships. So to summarize all of that, I, I return again to, the, to this graphic uh, screen where you can see uh, nodes and relationships with their distinct names uh, as Tosca defined them. So basically, to describe any topology, you need very basic and simple building blocks, and you, you have a pluggable framework to plug in any tool that you want to execute this uh, topology. Now, what we're missing now is the, uh, the workflows, which are the imperative algorithms to, to, to actually invoke those, uh, invoke those uh, hooks, and we need a workflow engine to run those workflows within. And this workflow engine will actually time the invocation of, of those operations. So we have a very complex orchestration uh, in place with any kind of flow that we want and with all those validations that we need uh, to make sure that each task actually happened and we have the node in place so we can put another node inside or we can wire it, glue it with, an, with other nodes. And we actually are building the application step by step in the right manner, not just uh, as, for example, with Chef Server, we are guessing if the database already exists when we try to start the application server. Here, everything is timed and everything is, is well defined and known. Um, the last building block I want to talk about are policies. So policies, from our perspective, brings monitoring to the table. 
uh, monitoring is, is very important because unless you have monitoring, um, it's very hard for you to know if what you're doing actually happened and if it's still up and running. So if you can monitor, you can set uh, rules to enforce things like SLA, health, uh, performance, and anything else that you need. And if a policy, which is a set of rules, uh, evaluated all the time, ongoing, in an ongoing manner, says that something is wrong or something is not allowed, you can invoke another process or processes to fix that. So you have an ongoing feedback loop feeding back into your orchestrator and making sure that it's not just one process that you kick at a time, but you can actually uh, remediate your application or scale it out or in. And it's an ongoing process, so no manual intervention even after deployment. Okay, so putting it all together, uh, we've, we've seen that the, the Tosca template blueprint in our language contains the application topology with all the properties that I mentioned. Any set of workflows for all of your processes, all of your automation processes and policies to ensure that your application is up and running and in good shape. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about how we implemented uh, this uh, standard in our product in Cloudify. So the first, uh, the first process that uh, I want to show is how a workflow actually get uploaded to the server and executed. So you can see there's the front end part with the proxy, REST and file server and GUI. These are the channels to actually push um, the commands in and push the, the blueprints in. So once the blueprint is up there and it's uh, parsed and saved in the, in the database, uh, you can execute any of its workflows by just sending the right command to the workflow engine. And the workflow engine will actually use an algorithm to select the right node at the time from the, from the database, read the, the operation details that it needs to invoke, and put a task in the task broker and manager in order to, to execute that. And the next thing that happens is that an agent, whether it's a, a manager side agent or whether it's a, a, an agent uh, embedded inside the application VM, because some of the things that are going to happen are creations of VMs. Uh, so those agents know which, which task they have to execute because they are taking their task from a dedicated queue. And then uh, what they do next is they uh, apply a specific plugin as noted in the topology. So they can use Chef, they can use uh, Shell Script, they can use Puppet, whatever tool was uh, integrated there as the plugin. And they can actually perform the action that needed using the properties of the node as the configuration information. Um, the next thing that, that uh, Cloudify does is the policy and the feedback. So Cloudify can install monitoring agent of your choice on the VM or actually read information from the monitoring server that you already have in place like Nagios and then push streams of metrics and events into the policy engine. In the policy engine, the workflow engine already pushed in sets of rules, the policies as they were defined in the blueprint. So you have now um, an engine that gets streams of events and evaluate, um, evaluate the situation of your application. And uh, it can keep the monitoring data for uh, reports and it can also uh, fire out events like uh, invoking another workflow, et cetera. Okay, so uh, my time is almost uh, over, so um, I'll skip the demo that I wanted to show. Uh, I'll give some time for questions. Any, any questions? Okay, um, so if no. Oh, there is yeah, you have time for the demo. We have time for the demo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. okay, so. I think Uri showed this demo before, but I'm going to show the same, same type of demo. Okay, so uh, let me. Okay. 
Okay, so what, what we see here, we actually see the blueprint. So when I uploaded the blueprint, you can already see which nodes I have and what are the relationships between them. So in this case, that's a Node.js uh, application. So I have two types of virtual machines. The fact that I have the number one here means that uh, I only ask for one instance, but that doesn't mean that I can't ask for as many instances uh, as I need. So I ask for two types of virtual machines, one for the Node.js and one for the MongoDB. And inside these, I need a Node.js instance and a MongoD instance. And uh, inside the Node.js, I have the Node seller application that has a connection to the MongoDB uh, server. And now... Can you show us the, the demo slide? Sure. So I just need my mouse. Yeah, OK. OK, so in this case, um, you can see that the types here are, are abstract. OK, so it doesn't say which type of host I'm asking for. It just say host, and then it says DB server and app server. There is another YAML file, the nodeseller.yaml, which is non-portable, because this is portable. I can run this on any uh, uh, tool chain and on any infrastructure as a service. There's another concrete file, nodeseller.yaml. Unfortunately, the GUI still doesn't show that, that file. But this file would declare the specific types and in those specific types, for example, I, I'll have, um, uh, instead of cloudify.types.host, I'll have cloudify.cloudstack.host. Uh, um, OK, in this case, you, you did it even more specific. You call it exascale. And, and this type has the lifecycle operation, like uh, create, start, stop, delete. And in this case, uh, URI wired this, those operations into a plugin in Python that works against uh, libcloud to actually uh, invoke those uh, uh, IIS uh, methods. Um, in, the, in the same way, uh, we uh, implemented the MongoDB and the, and the Node.js uh, concrete types. And in this case, they're using a bash plugin that uh, gets bash scripts to execute and create those, uh, those middleware uh, pieces and to push the, the application part into that. So um, we can also see here, let me scroll. Sorry. If I go into the deployments, you can see the actual uh, runtime uh, environment. And in this case, uh, we already executed. There is a, there is a select workflow here. We, we can execute uh, each workflow that we want. In this case, we executed the install. And we can see the actual runtime nodes that they are available. And uh, we can actually see uh, if we look at the, the information. I think you can see the, I need to. Yeah, you can see the actual IP uh, of this, uh, of this uh, instance. And I can create another tab. Yeah, it's 8080. I guess I'm going beyond the five minutes, but anyway. Uh, but your client is a great system. Okay. So I don't know if that's actually, uh, it should come, but it's very slow, I guess, the internet. Or can you show it on your computer? Okay. So once you create that deployment, what can you do? I can actually, uh, in this case, I didn't, uh, I don't have yet uh, things like upgrade or uh, uh, continuous delivery workflows, and I don't have the policies for that. But basically, think about it as I, I have the building block, so I can add a workflow that just do an upgrade, and I, maybe I want to do the upgrade in a way that I first push the code only to one instance of Node.js, then I do some test, 
and then I, I, if the test is okay, I get some indication uh, to the policy engine. The policy engine can command the, the rest of the cascading deployment. So I can do, for example, canary strategy. Or um, in case I want to uh, scale out, maybe I want to add another Node.js or I want to add another uh, shard to the MongoDB. I can do all of that uh, using uh, workflows. Uh, in, 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 in order to do that, I need two things. I need the workflow and I need those hooks. I need an, an additional interface uh, to my node. So Tosca only, uh, in, this, in this stage, Tosca only talks about provisioning and the, the very rudimentary interface. But as Gigaspace, as, as Cloudify, uh, we are not waiting for them. And we probably add our own interfaces for those post-deployment uh, Operations. We, we are going to add, uh, to release this uh, version 3 product in, in July, and by then we, we will have the policies and the, the additional interfaces in place. And of course, as it's an open source uh, product and, and as it's, it has the Tosca uh, framework, you can actually, you don't need to change our parser in order to add your own interfaces, your own types, your own plugins, and your own workflows. It's, it's already that the mechanism to execute those custom types is already there. So you don't need to wait for gigaspaces for that. It's, a, it's an extendable, it's an extend, extendable language. How does Tosca work with the agents? Like the, the, the agent part of Tosca as well? Or no. Agents? So the agent is an implementation detail. So um, IBM has a, a more kind of rudimentary implementation of that. So they don't tell you. Uh, you can have this or that plugins. They give you an agent with a certain set of plugins, and from from their perspective, it's it's an implementation detail. So you can only ask for the artifacts that they know how to execute. So I think they know how to execute only Chef and and Bash. So if you want to have PowerShell, too bad for you. So uh, to, the the standard doesn't talk about that. It assumes that you will do something that will allow for the kind of infrastructure and tools that you want to use in your implementation. And I think we take it to the, to the vision of Tosca, making it completely portable. So our agents are in Python, but uh, the plugin uh, module is, is uh, written in a way that you can use the, the Python only as a facade to anything you want. And from our perspective, there is also a REST interface as part of the agent, so you, you can also pass information between, between the Python part, between, between the Python facade, and to the whatever sub-process that you're forking there, and back to the database to report runtime properties. So we don't want to lock you into any, any kind of programming language or, or tool chain, because we think that that's bad. OK, and you can see the application, and actually, it, it, you can start browsing the seller and see that it actually installed and actually connected the, the MongoDB database. And I think by that, uh, my presentation ends. And so thank you for coming. <laughs>